I'm Catherine Taylor, Deputy Director of English Pen, and I'm delighted to welcome Valeria Luiselli, London Book Fair Author of the Day, to the Pen Literary Salon. Valeria Luiselli has been fated as one of the most exciting and innovative new Mexican writers. Born in Mexico City, she's lived all over the world and is now settled in New York. She's the author of the novel Faces in the Crowd and a collection of essays, Sidewalks. Her work has appeared in The New Yorker, Granta, McSweeney's, and Dazed and Confused. Her new novel, The Story of My Teeth, translated by Christina McSweeney, is a dental autobiography, reflecting on the nature of storytelling, creativity, art, and the longevity, or otherwise, of literary celebrity, wrapped up in the life history of Gustavo Sanchez Sanchez, otherwise known as Highway, a security guard turned self-made auctioneer whose mission is to sell his collected ephemera in order to fund the replacement of his missing teeth. Valeria is going to read a passage from the book and then we're going to start with the interview. Hi, I just want to say that it's not my dental autobiography. <laughs> it's not a memoir. It's uh, Gustavo Sanchez Sanchez, his autobiography. I'm the best auctioneer in the world, but no one knows it because I'm a discreet sort of man. My name is Gustavo Sanchez Sanchez, though people call me Highway, I believe with affection. I can imitate Janis Joplin after two rums. I can interpret Chinese fortune cookies. I can stand an egg upright on a table, the way Christopher Columbus did in the famous anecdote. I know how to count to eight in Japanese, ichi ni sanshi koroko shichi hachi. I can float on my back. This is the story of my teeth and my treaties on collectibles and the variable value of objects. As any other story, this one begins with the beginning and then comes the middle and then the end. The rest, as a friend of mine always says, is literature hyperbolics, parabolics, circulars, allegorics, and elliptics. I don't know what comes after that. Possibly ignominy, death, and finally, postmortem fame. At that point, it will no longer be my place to say anything in the first person. I will be a dead man, a happy, enviable man. Some have luck, some have charisma. I've got a bit of both. My uncle, Solon Sanchez Fuentes, a salesman dealing in quality Italian ties, used to say that beauty, power, and early success fade away, and that they're a heavy burden for those who possess them because the prospect of their loss is a threat few can endure. I've never had to worry about that because there's nothing ephemeral in my nature. I only have permanent qualities. I inherited every last jot of my uncle Solon's charisma, and he also left me an elegant Italian tie. That's all you need in this life to become a man of pedigree, he used to say. I'll leave it there. Thank you. And that's a wonderful flavor of the larger-than-life character and persona of uh, Gustavo Sanchez Sanchez, otherwise known as Highway, for reasons that aren't entirely clear in the book. Um, how did you build up this construct of this, this really quite pompous character who, who is, who is um, writing his own life story essentially for posterity? Well, the, the book is written in installments. Mm -hmm. I should start from there. It was written in installments for the workers of a juice factory in Mexico called the Humex factory, which in turn funds a very big art collection called the Humex collection. And I was commissioned a piece for the Humex collection for an exhibition that they had. And they wanted me to write a, a kind of blog. And I said, no, I, I don't do blogs. Like, I, I once had a Tamagotchi and it died. So it's the same kind of thing. And so I said, I won't do blogs, but if you want to know that I'm working every week, I can, I can write an installment. And um, I would rather work for the factory workers or write for them than really just the gallery space. So then after some negotiation, they agreed and I, and I started sending weekly installments to mm. the workers in the factory. And now the, the voice of Gustavo Sanchez Sanchez, at least the way I conceived it at the beginning, um, 
was kind of based on the voice of an uncle I have who is a tradesman in a big market in Mexico City called the Central de Abastos, which is probably one of the biggest markets in the world. There, there, there might be something bigger in China, but I, I really doubt it. Central de Abastos is really a place where everything, where everything, you can find anything from uh, cars to the best Spanish ham to um, any kind of stolen good to great books. And my uncle is a salesman there. And he always used to tell me stories about the things he sold and traded. And he has a kind of savvy, uh, streetwise thing about him that I really wanted to capture and put in a book. So the initial voice came from him. But then, as the factory workers read these installments, they, they read them out loud. And those, those out loud readings were recorded. And then so were their comments and criticism of my installments. And they were recorded and sent back to me in New York. And I heard all of those and, of course, took them into account for the next installment. And there was one particular voice of one of the workers that I really kind of fell in love with because he, I don't know, he, he, there was something a little bit um, uh, picaresque about him. Mm. Um, he was very mean with his criticism on when I sent him things that, that he didn't like. Uh, so I almost had a kind of um, pike with him. And I started emulating his reading voice mm -hmm. in a way, in, in the way that I was writing. So, so the voice shifted and it turned out to be an amalgam of, of, of these two voices, my, my uncle and this one worker's voice. And actually, you're talking in the background to the, you know, you've based, in a way, a kind of a portrait of your uncle in many ways and of his collection of ephemera. And you talk about the method of auctioneering because Highway basically turns the commodification of the auctioneering process, the enterprise, to his own advantage. What he's doing is he's passing off his remaining teeth as relics from illustrious figures, he claims, as various as Plutarch, Virginia Woolf, Montaigne and St. Augustine, and he's selling them off to the highest bidder by fashioning the most fantastical stories around these teeth. Mm -hmm. And um, in a way, he is revealing, and you are, the, the whole meaningless enterprise yeah. of putting a price on an object and what people will, people will bid for it yeah. as long as they're persuaded that the story behind it is compelling. Yeah. I mean, I think it is all about narrative. Yeah. Um, and the, the value of things is, is, is of course, um, something whimsical. My, my uncle used to tell me, because I used to read, read when I was younger, and he used to see me reading, and he used to say, what are you doing now? Put that thing down. Me, I buy books by the meter, and that's all I cared. <laughs> the thicker, the better. No, they can occupy the more wall. And uh, I mean, th that relative value of, um, of art objects I bring into literature. So I, I was having a conversation in a way, not only with the workers, but with the artworks that they were um, also thinking about. And of course, one of the things that they constantly discussed in those reading sessions was the worth of the art objects that somehow their work ultimately mm -hmm. funds, right? A lot of work, maybe years of work, will eventually fund one contemporary art piece, say a desiccated dog by Mauricio Catalan, right? So th there, there's something, of course, even obnoxious in that. And um, I wanted to have a conversation with, with that phenomenon. I, want, I wanted to put that in, in the page, but I didn't want to be obvious about it. I could have written a treatise about the whimsical or you could have Value. written a polemical tract or a pole rather than or, or the more whatever. subversive nature of story writing and stories within stories. Absolutely, and, and I, I needed to transport that back into literature. Mm. So one of the mechanisms that the novel reproduces is kind of displacing objects and rethinking about their value outside their context. And, but I don't do it with art objects, but with names of famous writers. So I treat writers as objects and just kind of displace them, place them outside their, the context that gives them um, meaning and significance, and treat them as kind of everyday people, uh, truck drivers and um, people that work in markets. And I, I, I try to see how that works and how that affects the narrative around it and vice versa. Can I ask you 
ask why you decided on the metaphor of the book, which of course is teeth. You write that the teeth are the true windows of the soul. They are the tabula rasa on which all our vices and all our virtues are inscribed. And I've been looking at a lot of teeth since I've been reading this book, and I'm trying not to become fixated on yours. So. Well, I have trouble. Every time I, I say the, the title of my book, I, I start <laughs> just like not wanting to show my teeth. And Carretera, the, um, I mean, Highway, has a, a theory. The narrator has a theory, which is that um, writers who show their teeth are just pure tarlatans. So that you should never trust a writer that smiles showing his teeth. No? And I mean, it's not something that I th think, it's something that my narrator thinks. <laughs> um, nevertheless, I have made a very conscious effort not to smile or showing my teeth anymore. So you're going to look quite miserable during this, <laughs> during this interview. I think also the, the aspect of the teeth, they're very obvious signifier of a person's status, aren't they? Of course. You know, of wealth, of health, of position in society. Exactly. That's a very important, that's a very important point. There's, there's an anecdote I really like, which is, um, so Proust was a, a good friend of Montesquieu, who was, of course, one of the, the coolest men in Paris <laughs> at that time, a noble. And he was full of very... Um, Baroque gest gestures, I guess. And one of the things that he did was cover his mouth when he laughed, Montesquieu, not Proust. And apparently he did so because he had teeth that were really black and really small and really ugly and pointy. So he used to cover his teeth. And Proust, who used to emulate Montesquieu in every possible way, used to laugh covering his own mouth, although apparently he had beautiful teeth. Um, so. That just, I mean, I guess it's a, that illustrates the kind of always um, a writer who is usually a middle class person, not always, mm. not necessarily, is always kind of a social climber, always aspiring mm. to belong to something that is not entirely his or hers. And I think that teeth always betray. Of course. I Maybe. mean, it's the most expensive, expensive thing to well, fix in Well, you make your a kind of interesting uh, reference to a writer we shan't name who paid an awful lot of money to have a new set of teeth and got a, a new agent as a result of it. Um, a British writer that I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, talking no about comment, but <laughs> I, I, I would love to write a novel that would get my, ticks, my teeth fixed for <laughs> forever <laughs> or just get new teeth. Maybe you will with the sales of this book. Um, going back to the kind of the auctioneer's undertaking, um, which is that of a commercial transaction, but actually the more subtle transaction in the book is that between the writer and the reader. And how important do you think that form of exchange is? Mm. Well, in terms of how this novel was mm. written, uh, that was an indissociable part of it, right? I mean, this, this was a... a a novel that I conceived as, as a bridge between two worlds that are very disconnected, although they are because they belong to the same institution, a, a factory, a juice factory and their gallery. So this, the novel, this novel wanted to be, in its original, original version, something that, that really worked as a bridge, like where language kind of worked as a narrative tissue that connected two things that were not connected. That were actually quite polarized. Really. That were actually quite polarized, even though they, they coexisted in the same environment. So there, there, was, there was that purpose mm. uh, in, this, in the original version of this novel. But I, don't, I, I wouldn't be prescriptive about what you're talking about. Mm. I, I don't think that all writers have to necessarily always be engagé and always write books that have um, a particular social um, motif or intention. I think, I think that, that writers are free to choose whatever they want to choose, otherwise what, what are you in this for? Right? But that's actually one of the great aspects of the book because it's a huge amount of fun to read and as I imagine it must have been to write and I'm thinking particularly that you obviously mentioned how you, um, how you weave writers, fictitious or living or dead, into your works. And uh, I'm just quoting from Highway here as, an, as the auctioneer, maybe as you as the author. I expurgate, I find, I aromatize, clean and disinfect, I recycle. 
And the book is full of reimagined, rewritten statements from artists and writers. Um, I was particularly struck by Walter Benjamin's Angel of History being rewritten as the Bat of History. Um, and it doesn't diminish, it rather amplifies. Um, yeah. And, and how, how much fun did you have really reworking and embellishing on sort of quite um, famous quotations? I had fun. I'm not going to accept that I laughed at my own jokes. <laughs> that would be the worst thing <laughs> that a writer can do. No, but I do want to say something about what, how, what you mentioned uh, with regard to quotes. I, I collect mm. a lot of quotes. I, my notebooks are basically other people's ideas. I, I, every time I read something that, that I'm interested in, I, I copy it and well, I, I reference it. And, and my books are written very much as a result of, of, of collecting a l quotes for a, a long time. And I had the, I had the problem when I published my, my last two books in English, um, where I had all these quotes in the book, in the books, and um, suddenly someone told me that there was something called copyright uh, oh, yes. And that you had to pay for quotes, which is uh, just crazy. How, how, why would you pay when you quote something? It's quoted. But anyway, I, I was told that I would have to pay if I, if, I had to, if I wanted to quote Pound or Wolf or anyone born 80 years uh, back. So I said, I promised myself that I would write a book uh, full of quotes that I wouldn't have to pay for. <laughs> and this book is full of quotes that I don't have to pay for. That's fantastic. Um, going back to your, to your background, you were born in Mexico City and you grew up in different countries and continents, in fact. How much would you say this has affected your writing? Because your, your first novel, Facing the Crowd, and this book are very polyphonic novels. There, there, there are many voices in them. They're very much populated. And do you find that experience of having lived in different countries and with different languages has actually really influenced that? aspect of your writing? I think so. I mean, mm. the, the fish doesn't see the water, right? But yeah. I, don't, I, don't, I don't know any, any different. Um, but I think it, there is. There, I think the, re the relationship I have to Spanish and to English, in another sense, is very much determined by my not having grown up mm. in my, my city of birth, Mexico City. I always grew um, outside Mexico City in, in Korea or in South Africa or in India and in other countries. And so my relationship to Spanish was always conflicted and a bit tortured. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 I wrote horribly in Spanish until I was about 14. So I made a very conscious effort when I was around 15 to write really good Spanish. And it was something that I, I, I a task I set myself and, and it took me a long time to even just start spelling things correctly. Um, but was that a resistance, do you think, in yourself? Or especially around that age as well? Is sort of it wasn't. It was more like a, a need to ground myself mm. somewhere and in something. And I mean, w the, the way that it is now is that I, I, I go back and forth from Spanish to English. And well, my, my translator who's here, Christina, can can, can tell you a, a bit about that. We, 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 we have very intense and fun and wonderful exchanges when we translate. Um, and it's partly because w as soon as I pick up her English, uh, I start sort of reimagining my own work in English and then I add things. And then my, my books in English are kind of versions of my book in Spanish. They're, they're not translations really. They are translations. They're translated by, by Christina, but they're completely different many times. And that, that has to do with, with my own relationship. Something interesting there is too that I think Christina's translation of me into English has also modified my own voice in English. Mm. I've started writing English, um, kind of jumping on the back of the way that I'm translated into English, yes. which, which is a strange. But again, uh, it's so multi layered, it's like a geological strata, is. really, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. um, you, I was just reading a recent interview with you where you basically were talking about Latin American literature and you just said, thank God for the death of magical realism. And I was wondering whether you'd expand a little bit on that before we go, we go to questions. Oh, I wish I wouldn't say things. That <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> it's in print. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, no, no, but I mean, I can, I can 
stand up for that, definitely. I, I, I think I, I love mag I, magical realism, or I loved it once. Yeah. I, it was a very important, and very formative period, uh, uh, me as a reader, and uh, I think an entire generation. Um, but what I mean when I say that is that I think it's important for for uh, readers outside the the Spanish language, mm -hmm. readers in English, but not only readers in English, readers in Italian, in any other language, um, to stop stop thinking of Latin American literature only in terms of a few books that were written during the boom, yep. uh, as if nothing had happened before that and as if nothing happened after mm -hmm. that. So it's, it's, it's a label that's very comfortable. I guess everyone was taught it at school. Yeah. Um, so so it it's, it's kind of circulates, but it, it means nothing anymore. And, and I think it's, it's really important to, to kind of sh shove, it, shove it out of the way and start reading with fresh eyes. Absolutely, and keep it in, put it in its context. Mm. Um, we have, move, moving now to questions from the floor, and we have a roving microphone. So if you want to put your hand up, <coughs> would anyone like to ask a question? Uh, not over there. Oh, Hello? microphone's not working. Sorry. Microphone is working. Um, working. Lady, so many ladies. No, no, Just behind. <laughs> Hi. Well, I'm I'm Mexican. Too. I was born in in Puebla. I'm here uh, in, as a volunteer. And well, I've now that I hear you talking about the translation and speaking uh, English and Spanish and trying to work things out individually in each language. I was wondering how hard it was for you to translate um, like all of these very Mexican words and phrases that only make sense in Mexican Spanish, trying to make it make sense in, in English, but not only uh, for people who may know some words in Spanish from Spain, but also like make them understand in, in regional Spanish. Yeah, I think you would have to ask Christina that, but um, <laughs> I think what, what we worked out um, was that the best thing would always be to find expressions that were not necessarily the, 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 the fastest route to what we were saying or the most literal in the translation. So I, I remember one particular case um, and there was a sentence that said something like, Este niño es tan negro como el petróleo. So she, she thought, well, like, I don't know if like an English reader might, I mean, of course, an English reader will know that petroleum is dark, but the, this, the phrase sounded strange. The, 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 the literal translation would be, this boy is as dark as petroleum. Um, and Christina's solution to that was, this, this boy is as dark as the inside of a needle which I thought was a, v a very good solution because it, it, had some, it retained something mysterious. It, 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 it retained the character's um, constr like m constructions. And at the same time, it was something that, that didn't aspire to, to be literal in, in, its reference, in its references when translating. So, I mean, but really that's the translator's task. You know, there's a lot of there has to be a lot of creativity there. And, and a, for a writer, it's very difficult to do that kind of thing. That's why I think self-translation uh, doesn't really work. You, you, you don't have enough distance from the text to be creative. Thank yeah. you. Are there any more questions? I just want to point to it. Uh, I just noticed that Elena Poniatowska is sitting right oh, here. And yes. I'm all of a sudden really scared. <laughs> She's a, a very well-respected, wonderful Mexican writer. I've been saying <laughs> It's lovely to have you in the audience. I think, hello, there's the microphone. Thank you. Hi. Um, what part of the book are you proudest of in terms of writing and what you achieved in writing it and the quality of the writing and whatever else? <laughs> that's, a, that's a really good question. I have no idea. Let me, let me invent an answer right <laughs> now. Um, <laughs> it, the most difficult part was um, there's a series of, of lots um, where Highway is auctioning his old teeth that have been extracted and he's, he's auctioning them as if they were the teeth of the great. So he, ha so he auctions one of them as Plato's tooth, another one as Virginia Woolf's molar, another one as Chesterton's. Um, so I had, to, I had to go and find 
sort of teeth stories. Uh, and all the, all the stories are true, or hyper true, <laughs> as, as, my, as my narrator says. And pu putting that together with real information, um, so that it's not just like a, something out of, that I took out of my sleeve, but, but really something that referred back to the real stories of these people, um, and doing it in a very concise way that still held the rhythm of an auctioneer uh, giving his speech, that, that was very difficult to do. Yeah. Have we got any more questions for Valeria? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I was interested in what you said earlier about quotes and about that whole problem of how we uh, relate to other people's work, sometimes very closely, sometimes we make it part of our work. And it, it sparks our inspiration in a, in a way that um, sometimes is very difficult to tell apart. Yeah. Um, because it's gone very deep inside us. So I was wondering if you um, had thought of writers such as Cathy Acker, for instance, or here in England, Jeanette Winterson, who Jeanette Winterson, include yeah. in their work, if, you, if anyone remembers Art and Lies, it yeah. is a reading, for instance, mm -hmm. of four quartets yeah. with parts of that wonderful poem uh, so embedded in the work that nobody would think of saying, oh, that's a quote, do something about that. Uh, intellectual property, or Akir who w writes a book on Rambo and says all of this book is taken from uh, Faulkner and Rambo himself. So you know, it's, it's a very wide sort of area, and I, I don't have a particular question for you, but I wanted to um, remember that and remember how this core um, of quotes that we carry from those we have loved can't be parceled out into... No, I agree. One of know, my favorite property. books is, uh, is Erasmus's Adagios, no? which is precisely a collection of all the quotes that he ever uh, came up across and, and, uh, and noted down. And I think we, as readers, we are, we are collectors of others' thoughts, and as writers, writers are basically readers. Uh, um, there is no way to separate our own thought from others. It's kind of absurd to, to have laws that that don't allow a conversation on the page between ideas. And I think it was Osip Mandelstam who said, my library is my biography. Absolutely. So, yeah. Absolutely. Have we got any more questions? Uh, final question to wrap up. In which case, thank you very much, Valeria Luiselli, author of the day. And uh, Valeria will be signing books at the Foils bookshop adjacent to the salon. Thanks very much and a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.